Good afternoon. Welcome back to Metropolitan Community College's 17th Annual Diversity Matters Film Series. At this busy time of the year, we really, really appreciate your joining us today. Your microphones and chat with other audience members are turned off. Send your messages or questions for the speaker through the chat function to moderator Barbara Velasquez. Mm -hmm. Also, please watch the chat for a link to an online evaluation and other important messages. Farmsteaders is a love story, a farm story, and a story of contemporary rural America. Nick Nolan, his wife Celeste, and their young family are on a journey to resurrect his grandfather's dairy farm, fighting to keep his homeland from drying up and blowing away something that has happened to about 4.7 million farms in the United States as the pressure of corporate driven, driven food have left deep scars in the region. Director Sheena Mallett points an honest and tender lens at the beauty and hardship of everyday life on a family farm as the Nolans work to balance their fears and hopes with so much at stake. Nick and Celeste's meditations on life, legacy, and resistance bring complexity and depth to the national conversation and characterization of the rural white American. For the Nolans, only three things remain certain. Family is everything. Nothing ever stays the same. And the land holds it all together. First. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our discussion leader, Mr. Art Tandrup, who grew up on small farms in Northeast Nebraska. He earned degrees from Northeast Community College, Wayne State College, and the University of Nebraska at Omaha. He had a 35 year education career, and the last 30 years were at the Takema Herman Schools. He also worked four years at UNO as an adjunct faculty member. Some of you from the Metro community might remember Art's wife, Helen, who spent 23 years in the financial aid department at Metro Community College at the Fort Omaha campus. Art and Helen have two children and two grandchildren. Following retirement, Art and Helen moved back to the family farm near Neely. They grow corn, soybeans, rye, cover crops, and sacred Ponca corn. Please welcome Mr. Art Tandra, who's going to share with us some of his thoughts about farmsteaders. And I am starting to receive questions. Please continue to send those to moderator Barbara Velasquez, and I will present your questions to Mr. Tandra. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh... Like Barbara said, uh, my name's Art Tandrup, and uh, we're up here north of Neely, Nebraska, and we are not getting snow yet, but we've been getting some drizzly stuff that'll probably later tonight turn into some white stuff, and uh, uh, being on a farm, moisture is important to us, and, um, you know, a lot of times our uh, city friends don't understand why we pay so much attention to the weather. Not that it does a whole lot of good sometimes, but that it does, uh, uh, that it, moisture is very important for us. And uh, the, um, you know, we think of the Nolans and their, uh, their small farm. And, you know, they're kind of bucking the trend in uh, modern agriculture because so many things have gone towards cor corporate agriculture, you know, where, quote, bigger is better. And, uh, you know, shove the small guy out. You can't make a go of it, you know, let the big guys do it and and so forth. And we, you know, today we saw the struggle that the Nolans have, have had 
And when I did a little research on them, the latest update I could find was in 2019 uh, when they were they were still on their farm. And of course, their kids are getting bigger and so forth. So uh, that they, you know, the latest I could find is they're still operating this this farm and selling cheese uh, uh, every day of the week. Um, so with that, I'd like to get into a chart that um, talks about what do farmers actually get for the things that they do or, you know, for the things that they produce. You know, we all, and here especially in the last year, we've seen the high price of food. Uh, and we we think, well, those farmers must be getting rich. But we just take a look at uh, the first one, you know, almost all of our favorite food here, bacon. And, uh, you know, that we go buy that pound of bacon and anymore it's about seven bucks and the farmer's just getting a little over a dollar for that pound of bacon. So, you know, what's wrong with this picture? And we can, you know, we can take a look at all these products and see, uh, you know, how little the farmer gets paid. Uh, the milk, like the Nolans are producing here, uh, today, you know, we all know it's over four bucks a gallon to buy a gallon of milk, and they're getting just a little over two dollars if they sell their milk for milk. Uh, and the situation that they have where they have an old parlor like that and so forth, they would not be able to get um, that two dollars a pound or two dollars a gallon, excuse me. Um, because they would not have a high enough quality facility to sell milk that would go into, uh, you know, milk jugs. They would have to sell to places like uh, like cheese factories and uh, other milk byproducts type places, which uh, would reduce the price of their milk significantly. So anyhow, as you kind of as you kind of see here, you know, I guess the my point is is the high cost of food. The farmer is not getting rich off from that, uh, and in many cases, they are not getting um, they're not getting what uh, what they have put into it and so forth. Um, we live uh, we live on a small family farm. My wife's family farm. Uh, it's, um, a, you know, less than 160 acres, a quarter section, what they call it. And uh, her uh, her parents, her grandparents all made a living off this farm. She and I could not make a living off this farm today because, uh, you know, it just it just doesn't it just doesn't work on the small scale. And you have to admire the Nolans for being brave and uh, uh, you know, taking on a huge challenge of working every day of the week, every day of the year, and and still struggling, you know, to have a good life. But they they made a decision. And so many of us that are on the, that are on small farms yet, we love the land, we love growing food, and we enjoy being good stewards of the land and the earth's creatures that are here, uh, you know, and contrast that to the huge corporations that, uh, you know, in a way they're kind of like a factory and they're just making widgets. So the widgets, uh, you know, how many widgets can they pump out and how many widgets can they sell? A totally different mindset than what uh, your average small farmer does. So with that, Barbara, I'll let you go into the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Art. We're so excited to have you here. Um, you know, so we, you know, we can feel the tension. We, you just talked about the, you know, the relatively small amount of money that um, they might get back for their product. And she did tell us that they couldn't make it on milk. So she turned it over to cheese. And then we can see the extreme amount of extra work that she goes through to get the cheese produced whereas if it were milk they could just load it up and you know it would be gone um but the tension you feel throughout 
the documentary related to, you know, whether or not they're going to be okay. Um, one of their big um, clients has a catastrophe of a fire. And so immediately they have to be looking for new markets. Um, you and I talked a little bit about the gamble. Can you can you speak to that and what you're aware of that, you know, someone who's trying to make a living, they're not retired like you are and maybe able to make some different choices. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, all of us, you know, or a lot of us, anyhow, you know, we might take 20 or $40 and go to the casino and, uh, you know, we say, well, when it's gone, we're going home, you know, but there might be somebody out there that says, I need to win $500 or I need to win $1,000. And, you know, that may happen once in a great while, but it doesn't happen every time that one would go to a casino. On the farm, you're taking a gamble every time. You know, uh, we'll take a look at the Nolans here. You know, they they have cows. Um, when you have animals, uh, and this is one area they didn't really address, sometimes they get sick and die. And so they have to be replaced. And so you've got you've got a risk there. You've got a gamble there. Uh, other things can happen. They can get uh, disease in a in a milking cow herd, and when that happens, their product is even making into cheese cannot be sold. Uh, so there, until they get the disease cleaned up, uh, you know they would not have any income. And as you, as we all saw, they're on a very tight margin with what they're making, and so they're gambling every day of the week, uh, every every week of the year. Uh, they're gambling that certain things happen, and then you know, as uh, we saw, the fire that took one of their uh, major clients out of business for a while. You know, there's a big gamble, and and you know they were able to come up with a plan B and go ahead and, you know, kind of try to expand their smaller markets so that they could make up for that. And then when the uh, business came back online, they were able to uh, take that back again. But that doesn't, that doesn't always happen in something like that, that, uh, that business may have decided to close down for good. So an, another gamble uh, that they took, um, you know, I know uh, I gamble every year. Uh, we, uh, since we're kind of semi-retired, we don't own any livestock. Uh, if I were younger, we would. Uh, but so we just plant row crops. And, you know, this, this year, uh, you know, the uh, grain prices went up a little bit, and so all the big corporations that sell inputs they they raise their costs significantly as well. And for example, on um, to get an an irrigated acre of corn ready for harvest, uh, it cost me over twelve hundred dollars per acre, and you know, things can happen where, where, you know, you just, that would all be destroyed with the changing weather and climate and so forth. Uh, we could come in and have, have the entire crop wiped out. Uh, and then, you know, we were able to uh, sell the crop from that corn for about $14 an acre. So we, you know, we actually made a little bit of money, but if Helen and I were to live off from that for the year, we, uh, you know, we would be forced to sell the farm and, uh, and do something else because there just isn't enough for the small farmer to make a go of it. So you have that you have that constant risk. And then like in a year like this, uh, uh, Barbara mentioned just briefly, uh, we we grow some sacred corn for the Ponca Nation. And this year it was so very dry. Uh, last year we had a decent crop uh, and we delivered 
you know, a whole bunch of corn up to Niobrara to the Ponca. And this year we had uh, maybe one tenth of the crop that we had last year. And, uh, you know, you talk about a gamble there and, uh, you know, 150 years ago, that would have meant that a tribe had to deal with uh, deal with potential starvation and looking for other food sources and so forth. So the gambles have been here throughout the ages, and they continue to just become larger and larger. And you know, I kept as I the first time I watched this film, you know, I I kept waiting because I thought for sure we were going to see that farm auction sometime before the end of this film where the bank would come in and say we can't loan you any more money so we are going to uh you know have to have you repay your loans and the only way you can do that is to have an auction and sell you know sell your equipment sell your land sell that land that's been in the family for generations and uh, uh you know and then that may not have settled the debt. So, um, you know, the risk, that gamble is there. It's just a little bit different than going to, you know, a usual person's job or career type thing where you're pretty much guaranteed a paycheck. So um, there are, I'm gonna read some of the questions that are coming in, Art. Um, I appreciate you really kind of covered that the reality of that gamble. Um, and it, I trust that some of your answers might relate to your experiences or what you've seen from other people. But we have a kind of a general question of how do farmers endure the sustainability and viability of their farm over the long term? Okay, that's a that's a, a really good good question. And you know, making making a farm sustainable. And it's, you know, it there are so many different types of farms, and fewer and fewer of them are small farms. So consequently, you know, the uh, um the I look at the farms around me and most all of them are a thousand and five thousand acres. So they, you know, they aren't necessarily big ag, but they're growing towards that. They get bigger and bigger because the margins get smaller. And that's the only way that they can stay in business. Uh, one of the things that happens on the farm too, like when when I was growing up on on small farms, uh, you know, the women uh the wives, the women did not have off the farm jobs as a general rule, you know, occasion, you know, you had the usual woman occupations for back then, you know, nurse, teacher, uh, you know, food service, that sort of thing. But basically, you did not see in the rural areas, you saw no career paths, you know, and that has changed so much now. Most all the farmers in existence have a spouse that works off the farm anymore. And they'll have, you know, a job in town. They may drive 10 miles. They may drive 40 or 50 miles to find, to find a job. And with that job, they will they will try to have a job that has health insurance because that's a big issue on the farm anymore. Uh, and, you know, those kind of things help. And yet, uh, you know, we saw Mrs. Nolan and what, what a great motherly relationship she had with her children. Had she been working in a town someplace, you know, would have had her evenings and mornings, et cetera, but not necessarily that, uh, you know, the kids would have had to go to daycare, et cetera. And we all know all those kind of issues. So, so, you know, that, uh, that's something that, um, uh, family, uh, rural families are losing some of that family bonding that they've had in the past as families because, you know, the parents are 
example, you're either far or you're or you're employed uh, at wherever uh, so that you can put food on the table. Uh, unfortunately, there are, you know, bankruptcies every year. And so for those folks, it's not sustainable. And in many cases there, you know, their farm is sold, their equipment sold, and they may find employment on a farm. It's the one thing they know how to do. And so they may go to work for a big farmer or for uh, corporate ag, et cetera, uh, you know, which, which is really a sad, a sad story as well. So, you know, there, there is some sustainability there. There's also a problem with the folks that cannot, you know, just cannot emotionally handle that. And so we see a lot of stress uh, in many farm families. And like in Nebraska, we're fortunate enough to have the uh, rural response hotline which people can call into and, and get some help. But unfortunately, not all the people that need it know of it or, you know, or do follow through with, with getting some help. Uh, because, you know, one, one bad year can, can ruin a farm. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a very very challenging occupation uh occupation you have to be a kind of a jack of all trades which uh you know is enjoyable to a lot of people because you aren't you know you aren't making widgets in the factory uh so that part of it's good and you you know you're spending you're spending time with nature uh and the you know the small farmers especially uh they they have that they have that emotional tie with nature, with the land, with the livestock. And it's it's like a big family that uh, that are, you know, all those things put together. Uh, and somebody saying you have to leave that is very difficult. Uh, so it's, you know, it kind of is one of those things. And we, we hope... Um, you know, one of the positive things I see, we see a lot of um, like small urban farms or suburban farms or even uh, small, uh, you know, vegetable farms out in rural areas. And we see, you know, these folks that are, you know, catering to the farmer's markets and that sort of thing, just like the Nolans would go to with their cheese. And, you know, if you take those middlemen out of the picture, then you have an opportunity to make more money. So, but it's a lot of work to, to take that middleman out. So sustainability is, it, it's a difficult issue. Thank you, Art. Um... You do such a nice job of touching on the complexity because that's, you know, that's really what we're talking about here. And I think the documentary did a really nice job of giving us a picture of the jack of all trades, of the family relationships, of how children are part, definitely part of the overall success. Um, I know that, you know, years past, they talk about farmers raising a family so they had you know, they had hands <laughs> on deck, right? <laughs> and you can see it right there, right? <laughs> um, and and now, you know, you've brought in the emotional, um, psychological aspect and, you know, they didn't mention it, but I know that you are aware of the suicide concerns among mm -hmm. farmers. Um, so thank you, you know, thank you for sharing that. And I know that for some of our uh, faculty and students that are here that can contribute to their learning in the fields of human services. So uh, now this, this um, documentary was done in Ohio. Do you feel that it uh, depicts more or less what you've seen across the state of Nebraska? Oh, yes, I mean, it's, um you know you you take the scenery there 
and Nebraska has uh, locations. You know, you don't uh, just a little ways north of Omaha, you could have filmed that, you know, or especially in northeast Nebraska, uh, up along the Missouri River and back from it. You know, there's lots of areas here that the the terrain looks just the same. Uh, you know, people grow uh you know, like if they have a small dairy like this, they grow the they grow the hay for it for the livestock. They have the pasture. Uh, however, in Nebraska, uh, you know, we didn't see it in this film. Uh, they did not appear to be growing any of their grain that they fed the livestock. So they would have had to purchase that, which would have been an added, you know, that was an, an added expense. Everything that was in that, you know, grain wagon, they'd put in the wheelbarrow and the buckets that came. It looks to me like that came from off the farm uh, and that can get to be pricey as well. Uh, but you know, it, it's, I would say, you know, for a lot of the small farms here in Nebraska, it's very, very similar uh, type, you know, I, I can relate to what's happening in this film. And I think a lot of people in Nebraska could too. All right. Well, we are um, nearing the end of our time together. So Art, I would invite you, do you have any last uh, comments? messages you'd like to share with the audience uh sure i know it's you know if i guess if you have the opportunity to uh to visit some small farms i would encourage you to do so i would also encourage you to uh you know patronize the farmers markets uh you know you know in the cities there are a lot of them and some of them are open just during the summer but I know there are others that are that are open kind of year round, especially you get into some of the food co-ops and that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, here you're you're really helping out the people that work hard for their food or, you know, to create this food. You know, the quality is good. It might cost a tad more than what you buy, you know, the grocery store, but it's it's always going to a good cause and will serve your needs uh serve your needs well um and i guess i i just think as as people uh, you know have an opportunity to to mix with um small farmers especially uh you will you will see that they're great people uh they love the land, they love their livestock, and they have they have that great love for family that you just can't take away. So, I guess that's uh, that's kind of how I would uh, suggest maybe that uh, everybody has an opportunity to do. And if anybody's up in the Neely, Nebraska area, get a hold of me, and we'd be happy to show you our farm. That's very kind of you, Art. Um, I. Um... You can contact everybody. Can contact me if you'd like to to connect with Art and Helen. Um, we'll get that worked out for you. And and I didn't allow you to tell us about much about the sacred Ponca corn. I mean, do you want to let them know that what opportunities are available in spring and fall for the public? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how much time do I have? <laughs> well, you can spend five minutes three minutes how's that oh okay okay i'll give a quick i'll give a quick overview um this next year we will plant our 10th crop of the sacred ponca corn uh which is a, uh, a corn that was originally grown by the ponca nation we live on ponca land we also live on the ponca trail and tears uh the main one of the main areas that the Ponca lived was like 35 miles north of us up by Niobrara along the Missouri and the Niobrara rivers. And uh, we had an opportunity about, uh, well, it'll be 10 years ago now to, um, uh, to plant some of their sacred corn. And uh, one of the people that we had connections with was with the Oklahoma uh, tribe and he asked me if 
since their corn was taken away from them when they were moved to Oklahoma, that if he could find seed, if we would grow it here. So uh, he started researching the Lakota keepers of the medicine bundles and found the person that had that medicine bundle that was 137 years old at that time. And they bartered for a little handful of seed that was in there. It was their sacred red corn. And he brought that here and we planted it. And we also planted some other corn that he had uh, acquired from the Pawnee and other nations. Uh, so the first year we planted like four acres of corn. And since then we plant a little less than an acre. Uh, but we, every spring towards the end of April, first part of May, we, um, we hand plant this corn. And then in the fall, generally in October, around the middle, uh, we hand pick this corn and we have, we have a very, those days are very special. And we have, uh, uh, native ceremonies and so forth here as well, uh, you know, at the field. And we also have a prayer circle on our farm that we, we visit at those times as well and have some, uh, have some things happen out there. So, you know, these, these are open to the public and, uh, anybody that would like to experience that, you're more than welcome to come. So you did that in great time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Art, thank you so, so much for sharing time with us. Your life is busy. Um, I'm glad that the date we selected, you know, fit in. Um, mm -hmm. We negotiated a little bit about when, you know, would you not be busy with the farm possibly and then your other activities. So it's just been so so special to have you with us. I know you took this task on very seriously and you have given our audience so much information and, and your invitation for them to continue to learn through you and your farm um, is just so special. And it was really nice for those of us who knew Helen when she worked here to have her um, connected back today too. So thank you so much. No, well, thank you. So, um, Isaac, could you put up the slide for the evaluation? Audience members in the chat, you've got the link for the evaluation for today's program. We so appreciate your feedback. And uh, many of you know that over the year, we offer about 50 different programs. And for those of you who complete the attend this, complete the evaluation, give us your contact, you, um, will be recognized when you hit the magic number of 20. So there's still time during this academic year, which ends in June to collect 20 if you haven't started yet. And then um, I, I, I'm just kind of amazed because yesterday we had a program about joy and it was uh, comments from Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama, and today we're looking at farmers and their connection to the land. And to be so honest with you, the connections between these three programs uh, with tomorrow's book discussion on native presence and sovereignty in college. For those of you who've had a chance to read it or will join us tomorrow or pick up that book, the connection to land is so significant to these Navajo youth who were finishing high school and going into college. And it just ties into what we saw with the Nolans in Ohio and the love they had for the land and taking on uh, difficult circumstances, but caring so much about those who came before them and fulfilling their wishes and yet leaving something for those who are following them. So it's, it will be a great discussion tomorrow with Vernon Miller, who is the former chair of, of the Omaha tribe of Nebraska. He's joining us um, as he now is at Tufts University near Boston. And um, anyway, we, we really look forward to seeing you all and continuing these discussions. 
Thank you again, Art and Helen, and everybody have a great afternoon. We will see you tomorrow, we hope. Take care.